Good morning. Jesus is alive. Amen. What a wonderful thing it is for us to gather here on this Lord's Day and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is more than just a, a fancy historic event that, that is of curiosity. It is the event where we who believe in Christ, through Christ, conquer Satan, sin, and death in his once for all sacrifice on the cross and resurrection in the grave. And we, with, with joy and full of excitement, celebrate that this morning. So I thank you so much for joining us this morning. If you're a guest, maybe you're a visitor, Easter is a, a time of year that you get along to church. I want to welcome you. My name is Craig. I serve here as the lead pastor. And we're going to open up our Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. If you don't own a Bible and you can see one within reach, I don't mean your neighbors, I mean in the seat in front of you. You can see one in the seat back there. Go ahead and grab that. You're welcome to use that this morning. In fact, you're actually welcome to take that with you. That's our gift to you. If you don't already own a Bible, uh, please take that. We want you to be blessed. We want to have the honor of being able to, to give you that as, as just as, as our show of appreciation for you joining us here at Journey Christian Church this morning. Acts chapter 17. We're going to start our reading at verse 22. We're going to read all the way through to verse 34. Acts 17 verses 22. And onward, and this recounts, of course, Paul's encounter at the Areopagus, the, the, the great intellectual seat of the entire ancient world where the Apostle Paul goes to proclaim the truth of Christ. And so let's pick up our reading in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath. And everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. And even some of your own poets have said, For we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. At the times of ignorance, God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because, and this will be our key focus this morning, we'll dial in upon this jam-packed verse, verse 31, because God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection, uh, Paul's audience, when they heard, some mocked, but others said, we'll hear you again on this. So Paul went out from their midst, but some men joined him and believed among them is also Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. May God bless this, the reading of his own precious word. This was unlike any other evangelistic encounter that the Apostle Paul had ever experienced, any other encounter that he'd ever gone through, because Paul was in Athens ostensibly to, to take a rest. He had, he had had a, a gauntlet of an experience in, in Philippi where he had been whipped and the skin of his back removed and imprisoned in this kind of sewer dungeon where he was forced and shackled with Silas. And the story is they sang hymns and God miraculously exploded this earthquake and all the chains broke and they got saved. The, the Philippine jailer and his family got saved. It was, it was amazing. And then they went to Thessalonica and they encountered great trauma and tribulation and trial 
trials. They were hounded and, and persecuted and, and attacked. And then they went to Berea and, and the Jews of Thessalonica followed them all the way to Berea and continued the onslaught of attack. Paul arrives at Athens Something of a, of a shell of a man, something of a, of a beaten down, fairly discouraged, in desperate need of a rest, missionary of Christ. I wonder if you've ever, in reading your New Testament, if you've ever taken just a moment uh, to try and picture what Paul would have looked like. After all of these beatings and stonings and whippings and, and floggings and, and starvation and privation, after all of this culminative suffering that Paul had to endure. Have you ever tried to picture him? I mean, historic rumor is that he was only about five foot or so tall, very, very short. It was known that if you had suffered at the Jews, the, 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 the 30, uh, sorry, 40 minus one lashings of the whip, that that would force your legs to become bow-legged. You can picture Paul's face, right? His nose was permanently off to the side, cheekbones caved in, a clumps of hair missing from his beard. He looked like he had gone through a very gauntlet of hell, and he arrives at Athens, the prim and proper intellectual seat of the world where, where the world's wealthy would send their brightest, their youngest pupils to go and be trained in the philosophy of the Athenians. And Paul's meant to be taking a rest. And he walks about the city. We know Paul from the New Testament. And his spirit within him becomes so agitated at the perpetual idolatry. And so he can't help himself. What, 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 what does Paul do? This man that was, that was, that was completely beaten down, that, that couldn't even move right because, because of the wounds that were still no doubt fresh and raw on his body. He couldn't speak right because no doubt teeth were missing and tongue was swollen and, and, and the constant beatings and smashings that he took. And he just couldn't stop himself from proclaiming the gospel. And, and, and as he does this, he comes to the attention of the, the intellectual elites of the day, those that are known as the, the Areopagites. The, the Areopagus was the pagoda to Ares. That's where we get the word Areopagus. It was the, the pagoda to the, the Greek god Ares. And in that place, they, they had the, the heavyweights, the, the professional philosophers that, that we read in the text this morning. They did nothing other than sit around and debate and, and wrangle and interact and study and, and sharpen each other intellectually. That's, they were professional philosophers. And if you could imagine a contrast for just a moment this morning, here is the Apostle Paul, beaten down, barely able to move. His body is one open, gaping wound from head to toe, and he's proclaiming Jesus, and the people from the Areopagus, the, the professionals, they want him to come up and address them. There's, there's, there's something of a snarky remark they use. They, they call him a seed picker or, or a gutter sparrow. I don't know how your translation renders this phrase, but it's curious when they invite him up to, to speak to them and to visit with them, they, they don't have much kind things to say about Paul at all. In fact, in verse 18, the ESV says, what does this babbler wish to say, this babbler? Well, that's not entirely the fairest rendering of the Greek. They were calling him a, a seed picker, a, a gutter sparrow. And let me explain what this actual insult was conveying. One scholar says this, that when they called you a seed picker, they were saying that you are a rogue who picks up scraps from the gutter or hawks other men's ideas because you are either too lazy or probably too dull to have your own ideas. That's, what they, that's how they saw Paul. They saw Paul as an unoriginal, dull, and potentially lazy scholar, philosopher, intellect, but they were curious because remember, this is all they ever did. They sat around and discussed new ideas and interacted and debated and wrangled, and this was their livelihood. So Paul arrives at the Areopagus. The people were intrigued, and it sparked interest from the philosophical heavyweights who we read in verse 21, spent their time doing nothing other than telling or hearing something new. This was nothing less than the intellectual center of the entire world, and Paul has been invited to the highest court of ideas and asked to present his case. So Acts chapter 17, verse 31, I mentioned this earlier, will be our key focus in our study this morning. Paul lands his discussion, his preaching, his sermonizing, where he says, because God has fixed a day 
on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this, of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. For the apostle Paul, this was the one unassailable assurance of the truth claims of God and Jesus and the gospel. It was all founded upon and grounded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the one truth claim that validates all other truth claims. This was the claim. Should it rise or fall? Should it be found false or true? Everything else that Christianity or the Bible, or God and Jesus, everything else that they may claim to to state and to argue becomes either fallacious or transcendentally true. This is the one truth claim by which all of Jesus' other claims would be found true or false. And don't, don't misunderstand this morning. Jesus made some astounding, astounding truth claims. Audacious even. He, he claimed to have the ability to forgive sins, Mark 2.10. He claimed to be the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, Luke 24, 44. Jesus claimed to have authority over demons, Mark 9, 25, and authority over disease, Matthew eleven five, 5, and claimed to have authority over the inanimate world, like, like storms and bread and fish and, and such things. We see this in, in Mark 4, 35 to 41. And Matthew 14, 13 to 21. And and Jesus claimed to have authority over not just the inanimate world, like storms and and loaves of bread, but but authority over over the animate world, like like the animal kingdom, such as when Peter goes and catches that fish and and there's the, the money in the mouth and he pays the tax recorded in Matthew 17, 27. In fact, Jesus even made the indisputable claim to divinity. Not just, not just equal with the Father, but Jesus claimed more than that. He claimed to be one with God the Father. And his audience understood fully the ramifications of the claim. They picked up stones to stone him because of the blasphemy that they perceived he had uttered. Every one of these spectacular claims, every single one of them, does not in and of themselves verify the truth of Jesus' identity or the truth of the gospel. Only the greatest miracle that Jesus ever performed would do that. Now, it must be appreciated, and I don't know whether it is fully appreciated, that Israel in this day and age was poised for the arrival of their Messiah, of, of, of the Christ, of, of heaven's prophet. And, and because they were poised for it, Israel was crawling with two-bit, fly-by-night, snake oil salesmen, prophets and messiahs, crawling with them. And they all made similar audacious claims. They claimed to be Messiah. They claimed to perform miracles. They they claimed to to verify their Messiahship. This This was common. Many false prophets, even charlatans, crawled across the land of Israel, generating followings and generating movements. And this was the nature of this day and age. Could Jesus set himself apart from the rest? This one claim which Jesus makes will either prove that he is just another charlatan or he is in fact everything he claimed to be, equal with God, Lord of lords, King of kings, and having dominion over all. Here is his greatest claim. And this would bolster all the other claims that he made. By this one claim, Jesus himself will rise or fall. Let me give you how Jesus worded this because it's even more audacious and compelling in the words of Christ. In John 10, 18, Jesus said, No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. And in Matthew 16, 21, to give it in in a different phraseology, Jesus said this to his disciples. From that time onward, Jesus began to show the disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. Now, Jesus taught us, Jesus taught us a very essential, important principle. That moment that Jesus performed the miracle where he healed the paralytic, Remember that they're in Peter's house, or at least his mother-in-law's house, probably Peter's house, and, and, and the crowd was, had, had thronged so densely that they, they, these men couldn't get their paralytic friend to Jesus, so they began tearing apart the, the roof, you remember the story, lowered him down in front of Jesus, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. 
and his detractors in the room were deeply offended by this. Their claim was, no one can forgive sins but God. And the reality is, they were dead right. What they had failed to appreciate was that Jesus sitting there, performing the miracles and teaching as the rabbi, was fully and truly God. But that had been lost on them entirely. And so Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. And then they began, to, as they're sitting at the back and they're frustrated, they're, they're, they're angry, they're agitated. Jesus reads their minds, the text says. And he asks them this question, which, which is it easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or rise up, take your bed and walk. This man had been a paralytic for decades. You, you know the story, I'm sure, in Mark chapter 2. And Jesus says, to demonstrate that the Son of Man, that's himself, has the power on earth to forgive sins, I command you, rise up, take up your bed, and walk. And this man miraculously rises from his state of paralysis and, and walks in his healed and glorifies God. But it's the principle, which is it easier to say? Which is it easier to say? Many Christians have, have wrestled with this and wondered, what is Jesus getting at? Which is it easier to say? Now, it should be fairly obvious on the surface of it, that it is far easier to say your sins are forgiven. Because there is no way to immediately verify or falsify that claim. You're welcome, you, today, you're welcome to leave this place, walk around society, walk around your neighborhood, and just say to everyone, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven, your sin talk to your tree, your plant, your, your, your bush, talk to the street, talk to your letterbox, your sins are forgiven, and people can think you're out of your mind, that's fair enough, probably you would be, but... There's no way to falsify that. There's no way to know. And this is why Jesus says, which is it, is it easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or be healed, rise up and walk. Now the truth is it's easier to state that which can't be immediately verified. It's harder to say the one for which you will be thereby accountable so Jesus performs the miracle to demonstrate not just compassion upon the paralytic for sure, but to demonstrate truthfully that he is God incarnate with the authority to forgive sins. So which is it easier for Jesus to say? Is it easier for him to say, I'm God equal with the Father? Is it easier for him to say, I am Lord, I have control over the inanimate world and I can heal diseases, I can cast out demons, I am the Messiah? Is it easy to say that? Or is it easy to say, you can take this life from me and on the third day, I will rise from the grave. Now, it should be patently obvious to us all that those former claims, as spectacular as they are, to be the healer, to be the prophet, to be the Messiah, were claims that dozens and dozens of charlatans were equally making at the time of Christ. But this one thing set Jesus apart from all the rest he didn't just claim to be fully divine. He didn't just claim to be able to heal and have authority over the entire material world. He claimed, in fact, to die upon a cross, to be put to death, and on the third day be raised. This is the greatest claim, and the claim which would bolster and ground all other claims. This is why Paul the Apostle is now facing the professional philosophers, and he tells them this is the one thing for which we have an assurance for. Now, you have to appreciate, if we had time this morning, and we certainly don't, to, to look at in detail the difference between the, the Stoic philosophers and the Epicureans. The book of Acts tells us these were the, the two schools of thought that populated the Areopagus in that day and age. But these men, uh, uh, verbal wranglers and, and intellectuals of, of, a, of a colossal nature, had long ago given up any hope of finding anything of assurance. They were speculators, and they assumed that's all we could ever do. In our, in our finite existence, it's just, it's just speculate, just, just cast our bread upon the waters, proverbially speaking, and just, just hope. We can't really know. And this shabby, beaten down, shuffling, short apostle arrives and says, oh no, there is something that is undeniably, transcendentally true, and that gives us an assurance that God is all he has claimed to be, that Jesus is all he claimed to be, and that he was in fact crucified under Pontius Pilate, and on the third day he rose again, and this is the bedrock, not only of our faith, but of all knowledge, of all truth, of all reality. Now maybe you're here this morning, and you feel skeptical, just like these Greeks were, just like these Athenians. Maybe, maybe you're not convinced. Maybe you are a, 
an Easter at church goer. It may be sometimes sprinkle Christmas in there. But the reality is you're not really, you don't call yourself a disciple. The claims of Christ seem spectacular, but to you perhaps dubious. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's where you're at. But here's the reality. If that is where you're at, then you can know that you are exactly where the disciples were on the third day. Oftentimes, we don't spend enough energy thinking through this reality, but Jesus had been prolific as he repeated time and again to his disciples, hey guys, we're going to go to Jerusalem, they're going to kill me, and on the third day, I'm going to rise. In fact, there's one point Jesus says this, Peter, Peter grabs him, right? You remember, maybe you remember the story, maybe you don't. Jesus, I'm going to paraphrase because that's my style, right? He says, Jesus, you've got to stop saying this. It's really bringing down the morale of the group. I mean, come on, Jesus. Like, like, I don't know if you know this, Jesus, but we're really kicking goals here. We're really furthering the cause. We're really garnering a following. We're ready to take over the world. And all you keep talking about is going to Jerusalem, dying on a cross, and then some weird raising from the grave. And Jesus turns and says to him, get behind me, Satan. Can we just agree on something here this morning as as a gathered people of the Lord, can we just agree that if in your walk with Christ, you've never arrived at a level where Jesus calls you Satan, you're doing pretty well? <laughs> How often we beat ourselves up because we're not as mature or spiritual or holy or pious as we think we ought to be, and it's good to feel convicted, it's good to feel pressed on to growth, but when we look at Peter, oh, we get a world of encouragement all the time. We find ourselves constantly being, being encouraged by this example of Peter who just can't get on board. And here's the truth of it. When Jesus does, in fact, die, crucified, as he prophesied he would, he goes into the tomb. Have you not ever wondered why on the third day, literally no one was there? Now, we know that Jesus is God because the Bible has verified this truth and Jesus' resurrection has, has declared it clearly and unequivocally, but, but could you imagine if Jesus didn't know everything, what his reaction would be when that stone is rolled away and he knows he has said it time and time and time again and he comes out of the tomb and there's no one. Could you imagine I, I, maybe you think, well, Craig, doesn't it say that the women went down? Yeah, they went down with embalming spices, right? They weren't, they weren't going down to witness a resurrection. They thought he was dead as dead can be, and they went down to continue embalming his body so that the stench wouldn't become overpowering. That was their ministry. They just accidentally happened to be there when the tomb is empty, and there is Jesus standing there saying, do you remember how I said, well, this has now occurred? I, you know, what I scratch my head about, maybe, maybe you're not as unusual and quirky and weird as me, but I scratch my head and wonder why they weren't at least down there out of curiosity. Do, do, do you know what I'm saying? Like these guys were so, they were so gone in their doubt and unbelief. They, they'd given up all hope. They really thought they were making great headway following Jesus and all of his miracles and the fellowship that he was garnering and, and, and the crowds that were assembling and they believed this is going to be something. And then he dies. And they just go and get holed up in some upper room. They batten down the hatches. They lock the door. They bar the windows and they say, it's all over, guys. We have to give up. There is nothing left for us. Meanwhile, down the road... Jesus is exploding out of the grave, fulfilling the prophecy that he would, and none of these disciples were even aware, let alone convinced it could happen. If you're here this morning, and you're not on board, you're not convinced, you're not sure, you're at least at that level of faith of these disciples. These women went to the tomb, we talked about this, to embalm and use preserving spices one of these moments in Jesus' life where he announced resurrection and none of them understood or believed. This is the backstory of the truth of every claim that Jesus ever made. And Scripture doubles down on this and positions the resurrection as the central and most pivotal point of all of our hope, all of our faith, all of our knowing, and all of our confidence. In 1 Corinthians 15, verses 14, and then 17 to 19, let me read this so you can hear how these disciples had a complete change of heart and mind. Paul wrote this. He said, If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And if Christ, verse 17, has not been raised, your faith is futile. 
and you are still in your sins. And then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. He means those that have died are dead. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But here is the truth. That just as Jesus had prophesied and declared and given an account of himself, that yes, he will be crucified, and on the third day, he will rise in victory and triumph over Satan, sin, and death. Just as truly as he stated it, he performed it. And what is curious is this group, this group of shivering in fear, timid and petrified disciples who had locked themselves away in a room who couldn't even conjure up the energy or couldn't even conjure up the, the, the curiosity to at least go to the grave and just wait and see what happens. Such a magnificent change came over these men that cannot be described in any other way except that they truly saw the resurrected Jesus Christ. In fact, these men went from deniers, disbelieving in Jesus' promise to conquer death, to men who gave their own life in defense of this one central truth. Several of these disciples stabbed, speared, hacked to death with axes, one sawn in half, Simon the Zealot. Several of them in different regions of the world, as distant as North Africa to Syria to, to Russia, even as far as India in the ancient world. And most of them gave their life many decades after Jesus' resurrection independent and isolated from each other. Could, could you imagine, as, as skeptics today argue, that what happened is these very timid group of disciples, they, they, they felt like everything they'd done was a failure, it, it was a wash, it, it was gone, and they, they hatched this plan. Let's just say he rose from the grave, right? Now, I don't know, I don't know about any of you this morning here whether you really believe that that could be, in fact, possible. But if you know human nature at all, Getting 11 people to agree on a plan is, well, that's miraculous enough, right? That's almost, that's almost resurrection. You might as well just believe in the resurrection. But, but, but secondly to that, what makes you think that every single one of these men, now this is not, this is, maybe you sit there saying, well, I don't really believe the Bible, so I don't believe those accounts. Scripture is not where we go to find the end story, the end game of these apostles. It's actual secular history that records this for us. A number of them were crucified. Peter the Apostle famously crucified upside down because he felt unworthy to be crucified upright, just like his Savior. Andrew, Peter's brother, another apostle, also crucified. He begged the soldiers to not crucify him in the same way as his Lord upright, and so they, they turned the cross over into an X. These men are being crucified, languishing and dying over a period of days. At what point, just imagine you're Andrew, and you're nailed to this X cross. And it's been decades since you've seen any of these 11 men that you hatched this plot with. It's been decades. Most of them are dead already. Most of them are gone. You're in some far distant region of the world where no one will know, no one will hear, no one will care. And your tormentors say, we will let you down off that cross, provide the medical care that you need. You will live in the lap of luxury. Just deny that you saw Jesus risen from the grave. And he refuses not because, not because he hatched a plot with the other apostles, but because he did actually see Jesus raised from the dead. Because he couldn't deny what he knew to be true, what he bore witness with his own eyes. Hebrews 11.35 encapsulates this well. It speaks of the Old Testament martyrs, but in reference to the apostles, all of them refused to accept release so that they may rise to a better life. The disciple John the Beloved was exposed to being lowered slowly into a vat of burning oil as torture for preaching Jesus as raised. He's the one that outlasted all of them. Again, could you, just the power of your imagination this morning, imagine that's you. Feet first, slowly lowered, and below you is this immense vat that the Romans had been boiling this oil for days, and it, it reached an incredible, have you ever been burnt with like cooking oil? It is unbearable, right? And they're slowly lowering down, toes first, and at any point they say, just deny that you saw Jesus risen. What, do you really think it was? Just 11 of them getting together and hatching this plot? That now decades later, in far reaches of the earth, they continue to maintain 
the truth claim that they made, that they, that they lied and they bought into the lie with such veracity, such, such confidence and tenacity that they, they won't deny it? Do you know human nature at all? If they'd invented this, every one of them would have been quick to deny this as soon as it was at the expense of their life. Now, a curious part of the John story, as he's being lowered into this burning vat of oil, some of you know this, through a miraculous providence of God, he wasn't harmed at all. He just starts swimming around it. The emperor is so enraged that he's not in pain or dying, that's why they exile him to the island of Patmos, which you read is where he wrote the book of Revelation, the last book of your New Testament. What about the Apostle Paul? When he records a sampling of his sufferings, in 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 27, he says, Through imprisonments, countless beatings, often near death, five times I received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, danger from Gentiles, danger in the city, in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. That's a snapshot of the Apostle Paul. That is not a man so deranged that he hatches this plot with his other disciples and then endures all of this when at any moment he could have just said, guys, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest, we kind of made it up. Do you, do, you, do you know human nature at all? The constant veracity of the claim that these men were eyewitnesses to the risen Jesus. Not originally sympathizers. They weren't sympathizers. They weren't on board. But then when Jesus appeared to them, every one of them, even to the Apostle Paul, as he says in 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus even appeared to me. And then Paul says, and to 500 people at one time, all of which, well, many of which are still alive. This Paul is undeterred. We come back to Acts chapter 17. And there is the Apostle Paul, standing before these men, these professionals, these colossal intellects, the Athenian philosophers, and yet he's unintimidated by their taunts and their mockings, and he offers them something that they had long forgotten and they had never believed was attainable. What did Paul offer them? Assurance. Assurance. Take a look again, if you will, at this Key text, we're dialing in and zeroing in here tonight. It says in verse 30, we'll read verse 30 and 31, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed, and of this he has given assurance to all. To all. How rich. How profound, how beautiful are those two words, to all. Wherever you're at this morning, whatever life you've lived, whatever has brought you to this moment in your life, you can have assurance that God did raise Jesus from the dead. He reigns as King and Lord, and He is returning to judge the world in righteousness. You can know that with more determination, with more tenacity, with more conviction than you know anything else in all of your life. This assurance God has given to all by raising him from the dead. Now, the curious reaction of Jesus, uh, sorry, Paul's hearers that day is some of them mocked. Resurrection talk sounded foolish, sounded fable, sounded fairy tale to them, and, and they mocked. And maybe some here this morning would, would do the same. Others, others gave a, a, a polite hat tip, a, a polite nod. We want to hear more about this, but most scholars argue that they probably didn't really care to hear more, but it was a way at least of, of dismissing Paul politely and generously. But some believed. Some had that, that, that tremendous work of the Spirit on, on the inner person that, that gives them the conviction that Jesus is all he claimed to be. Everything Jesus claimed was true of who Jesus was. And at the ground of all of those claims is this, that yes, he will be crucified. Yes, he will be put to death. Yes, his death will be an atonement for sins. But on the third day, God, through miraculous power, shall raise him from the grave. And of this, we can know for certain. 
We close out our discussion in this passage asking the question, what should then, what should be our response? What's the right response to this? And of course, we don't have to go far to discover that because it is, it is self-contained in Paul's address. Verses 29 and 31, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an imagined form, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Would you bow your head and close your eyes here this morning as we look to close out this discussion around this assurance of our life, of our hope, of our faith, of all reality itself, that there is a God. He is knowable. He has communicated, and principally that communication is Jesus. As we meditate upon this and we ask ourselves this question, we are all God's offspring. In him we live and move and have our being. Every fiber of our being, every moment of our existence is sustained by a sovereign God. And if we're alive right now, it's because God has overlooked past sins. Because every sin any one of us have ever committed deserves the death penalty. And yet God in his grace and his mercy is patient with us all. He is long-suffering with us. And that God wants us to repent. He now commands, verse 30 says, all people everywhere to repent. What does that repentance mean? It means turning from your old way of thinking, of acting, of living, and turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. It means abandoning habits and practices of sin and rebellion against God and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Lord. It means to to grab hold of this assurance Not that you're believing in the resurrection of Jesus verifies it. It is objectively true. It is transcendentally true. But we're all called to ground our confidence, our hope, our future on this one fact. That yes, Jesus died and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. Granting victory over Satan, sin and death. Not only for Jesus, but for every single soul that trusts in him by faith. Father God, we pray to you this morning. We thank you, Father, for this gift, this gift of this revelation of truth. We think about these disciples, Lord God, and we think about our own moments of doubt, our own moments of trepidation and timidity. And we think about them, they, they, they were just the same, maybe worse. They'd seen the miracles of Jesus. They'd seen him walk on water and, and calm the storm and heal the lepers and, and, and raise, the, raise the dead like Lazarus and, and so on and so forth. God, they'd seen these miracles, but the one miracle they couldn't get on board with, the one claim that Jesus made that in that moment they were disbelieving was that he would conquer death. And Father, no matter how many times Jesus said it and reset it and stated it and clarified it, they didn't believe. And Father, that's true for some of us here this morning. As the preacher waxes on and gets energized and zealous and throws abundance of words at us, we just don't believe. But Father God, we know that belief is a miracle work of your spirit. Not that that the resurrection of Jesus needs us to believe in it for it to be true. It is the truth of all truths. And we thank you for that, Lord God. We thank you that history verifies it that secular and sacred sources verify it. We thank you, Lord God, that this is true. But you're calling upon us in our hearts not just to believe it as an abstract fact, but to believe it as the ground of our hope and confidence. To to place all of our faith and trust in Jesus, who conquered death, who takes away all of our sin through his atoning death on the cross and then rises from the grave. And gives every one of us eternal life if we just simply believe and receive him by faith. Father, I pray this morning there would be many who would have that experience. Maybe those that in the past have followed Jesus but walked away, they would return to this fountain of everlasting life. Maybe those that come to church just seasonally and here they are today and that this word would confront them in their apathy, rebellion and sin. And they would believe in Jesus and be saved. And for those of us, Lord God, who've been believers for a long time, I pray this word continues to stabilize us and ground us again in the confidence of the assurance of hope. We thank you for this. We pray your blessing upon this in Jesus' name. Amen.